Coming up, a balanced take on China's security challenges. We do try to look at the world from Beijing's point of view, and we see a very challenging environment for Beijing. Columbia's Andrew Nathan discusses China's security concerns both inside and outside of its borders and how the United States fits in. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. Our speaker is Andy Nathan, and he's an old friend of the Carnegie Council, so I'm delighted to welcome back to this forum. As one of our country's most widely respected China scholars, whenever Andy writes or speaks about Chinese politics or American policy towards China, his remarks are always worth paying close attention to. Today, he will be talking about a new book he co-wrote with Andrew Scoble, a senior political analyst at the RAND Corporation, entitled China's Search for Security. We do try to look at the world from Beijing's point of view, and we see a very challenging environment for Beijing. We talk about this challenging environment by describing what we call four rings of security concerns. The first ring of Beijing's security concerns is inside the territory of the People's Republic of China. You can think of them in two big hunks. One is the heartland, the demographic heartland of China, where most of the Chinese people live who are of the Han ethnic group, 94 percent of the Chinese population. And in that sort of main part of China, there's a great deal of turbulence um, as society modernizes, expectations rise, economic polarization increases, environmental challenges, water challenges. The ideology is, has lost its uh, credibility. People are believing more and more in religion. People are demanding more from the government. So there's constant turbulence in this Han heartland that the security apparatus has to manage. As you know, the Chinese security apparatus is very big, well-staffed, teched up. It tries to control and to some significant degree still has succeeded in controlling the internet and social media. It tries to deal with public demonstrations by a combination of repression and targeted uh, selective concessions to people. So even that piece of the security agenda is closely connected to foreign policy because there are many foreign actors who are um, trying to influence the development of Chinese society, the human rights movement, foreign governments who promote the idea of human rights in China, all the flow of uh, uh, foreign legal firms who are trying to tell the Chinese how they should develop their legal system, the international uh, uh, financial system and trading system that are trying to influence how things develop in China. So China is very penetrated. And then the second part of the first ring is the national minority areas, which include, of course, Tibet, not only the Tibetan autonomous region that you see on the map, but those other parts, parts of surrounding provinces around the Tibetan autonomous region where there are a lot of Tibetan people living. It's in the, actually in those regions, Tibetan demographic regions outside of the TAR is where these immolation, self-immolations have been taking place. So, the Tibet problem is even bigger than the footprint of this thing called Tibet on the map. And then there is Xinjiang, where the Uyghur people and some other minority peoples live and where there's a lot of resistance to Chinese rule. And there are some other less urgent but still significant security issues in other national minority areas. So for example, the Inner Mongolian Autonomous Region, although the Mongolian people are a minority in that region because of Han immigration. Um, they are not completely loyal to the I civic identity of being a PRC citizen. And on the Korean border, there's a Korean minority that thinks of itself really as Korean rather than Chinese, most of those people, and who provide um, a social environment where refugees from North Korea can oftentimes successfully kind of hide out. 
And there are other minority groups on the southwestern borders of China as well whose loyalty to the concept of the PRC is not 100 percent. And so um, in terms of consolidating control over their own territory, the PRC government has military control and coercive control over these areas of their territory, but they don't really have the buy-in of all of these populations. In, and the areas that are problematic are both vast and strategically important because they ring, they're on, the, they're on various borders of the country and have something to do with China's relations with surrounding countries. And again, the foreign factor is important in all these areas. Each of these populations has a cross-border uh, population in some neighboring state, and there is the possibility or, and oftentimes the reality of neighboring states. So I say uh, of neighboring states using those cross-border populations to destabilize Ch China. I say the possibility or the reality because in the case, for example, of the Uyghurs, China has achieved the buy-in of the neighboring Central Asian states through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that those neighboring states, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, they won't allow their resident Uyghur populations to assist the Uyghur movement inside of Xinjiang. So, of course, there's some leakage there, but basically those neighboring states are cooperating. But when you look at Tibet, it's a different picture. The Indians do provide a uh, sanctuary for the Dalai Lama and his government and his exile population, and so they allow. The, the policy of the Indian government is has a lot of nuance to it, but the bottom line, because they recognize Chinese rule over Tibet, but the bottom line of it is that they do allow the Dalai Lama to operate from Indian soil, and this is very destabilizing for Chinese rule over Tibet. So, so all of these first ring problems have international dimensions. They're part of foreign policy. And then the second ring that China has to deal with is 24, two dozen surrounding countries. And among those 24 countries, most of them are really problematic for Beijing. None of them is really a, uh, a, a Chinese culture society that, that, that automatically likes China. Uh, none of them feels comfortable with the rise of China. None of them trusts China. And some of them are very, very large and powerful militarily and have histories of conflict with China. Oftentimes that conflict is sort of determined by uh, geographic reality. So you think about looking around the periphery of China, there's Russia, you know, which is a huge country that is, has always been very, very suspicious of China. It's a completely different culture, different ethnicity, different view of the world. And the Russians are almost paranoid about the fact that you have this vast Chinese population on the borders of the underpopulated Soviet Far East. So although China-Russia relations are very stable now and in many areas cooperative, they're fundamentally distrustful of each other. Then you have Japan, which has a you know, bad history with China and which has its own security anxieties in which China figures as a major anxiety. So it's very difficult for China and Japan to get along. You have a country like Vietnam, which historically is very suspicious of China, India, and then the smaller countries around the border are also very difficult, a country like Burma, for example, which is so complex and always tries to retain its independence by balancing among different foreign uh, relations that it may have. Uh, a, a country like Mongolia, which is suspicious of China. And then the third ring that we talk about is comprised, it gets more and more complicated, of six regional systems. So each of the 
24 countries around China's borders is itself embedded in some complex regional system that includes other countries. So for example, the Northeast Asian regional system is pivots around nowadays the troubles of the Korean Peninsula. And China's got a lot at stake in the way in which the Korean problem evolves. And it cannot deal singly with the Korean problem. So when the United States has to deal with a country like Mexico, for example, it pretty much just has to deal bilaterally with Mexico. When China wants to deal with North Korea or with South Korea, whichever one, let's say North Korea, it has to consider the interests and try to juggle and manage the interests there of Russia, South Korea, Japan, and the United States. And one of the sort of funny quote unquote things that you notice as you go around all of these regional systems is that the United States is a major actor in each of them. So in Northeast Asia, it is as I just described, and the United States is very much a major actor there. In uh, Southeast Asia, we divide Southeast Asia into two spheres, continental Southeast Asia, which is Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and Burma, and maritime Southeast Asia, which is Vietnam again, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Brunei, and the Philippines. And of course, there are times when those two regional systems come together in the 10-nation ASEAN grouping, and every issue that is important to China in this area, the US is again a major factor. The South China Sea issue, China's relations with the Philippines, China's relations with Vietnam, with Cambodia, with Burma, every place that they look, they find that not only are there multiple countries that are jostling and sometimes ganging up on China, as in the case of South China Sea issues where the ASEAN states have pretty much joined together to try to force China into multilateral discussions over South China Sea issues. Um, not only do they have to juggle with multiple states, but they, in each case, they also have to uh, try to deal with American interests and American activism in all of these issues. And then the fourth regional system is that of South Asia, which includes, of course, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, and there you have the big elephant for China really is the Pakistan-India relationship. And so Pakistan has been, since the 1950s, has been a major strategic asset of China, not because China cares so much about Pakistan or has any important economic interests in Pakistan, but because Pakistan, because India, in the, starting in the 50s, aligned itself with the Soviet Union when China was at odds with the Soviet Union, and China found the relationship with Pakistan was helpful to try to help it bring pressure to bear on India. And this Pakistan relationship has been valuable to China continuously for that kind of reason, but of course you know that pa Pakistan is a very difficult uh, country for any outsider to deal with, and India's got a resolutely independent foreign policy of its own, and this regional system is highly complex as well, so the Chinese have to manage that. And then there's Central Asia, where China has important interests connected to the stability of Xinjiang and connected to oil and gas supplies but has to tread carefully lest it arouse the suspicion of Russia, which considers Central Asia to be a, his, you know, where it is indeed a historic zone of, of Russian uh, predominance. And then the, we talk about the fourth ring, which is the rest of the world, which is actually a, a lot <laughs> of the world, because the first three rings, big as they are and complex as they are, um, basically just involve uh, Asia. And for most of its history, the People's Republic of China didn't have much of a policy beyond Asia. Um, it had some engagement in Africa where it used 
pro-Beijing communist parties to make trouble for pro-Soviet communist parties as part of the Sino-Soviet dispute. It had some interests in East Europe where it again supported governments that were making trouble for the Soviet Union, but China didn't really have a policy outside of Asia until really the 90s when it plunged so deeply into the global economy and began to have economic interests all around the world and especially uh, commodity supplies, oil, uh, copper, soybeans, and all these things as China began to suck up a lot of world commodities. It began to have interests in the Middle East, in Africa, in Latin America, and needed to have a foreign policy to go along with those interests. And what it finds in this fourth ring in general is that it needs to be friends with any government that comes to power, whether it's the Sudan regime or the Iranian regime, you know, because it has to protect its economic interests in these countries. That's its general orientation in the fourth ring. We argue against those who, who, who have a nightmare that China will be somehow putting major military forces into Africa or the Middle East or Latin America and really challenging American and European preeminence in these areas in the security dimension. I mean, anything could happen in hundreds of years or, you know, in, in the indefinite future. But for the foreseeable future, we think China's interests in the fourth ring are predominantly economic, together with certain important diplomatic concerns that may look a little bit small to us but are large to Beijing. And those are Taiwan and Tibet because the Chinese foreign ministry has to make sure that all these 193 governments around the world understand the Taiwan issue, which is an issue that's hard to understand. And uh, since Taiwan itself has a lot of economic relations with many of these governments um, and is continuously trying to win sort of yardage in the uh, diplomatic game around the world, Beijing has to make sure that all of these understaffed foreign ministries and all of these small countries really pay attention to Beijing's position on Taiwan and on the Dalai Lama, where in those places where the government is tempted to offer a visa to the Dalai Lama, the, the Beijing has to do a lot of work to make sure that that doesn't happen. So that's our general perspective, and we see China as more vulnerable. It is a rising power, but when, when people talk about the China threat or how China will rule the world and things like that, which is the title of a book by Martin Jakes, we think they are looking at China too much from the outside. I mean, it's true that Chinese power has vastly increased, but at the same time, the security challenges that China faces are very, very large. And so we think uh, that for the foreseeable future, China is not going to rule the world and it's not going to present a fundamental threat to American interests. Now, this doesn't preclude friction between China and the US as China's power position changes. But as long as the U.S. doesn't drastically decline, if, the, if it won't, um, it'll still be there in Asia. American interests in Asia will continue to be great. And China will want to recalibrate the relationship because, because of these issues that I've mentioned. And so there will be friction. Can you comment on uh, the impact or the influence of China's growing energy needs on its global policy, particularly in the Middle East, Central Asia, maybe even Brazil? So, so China faces a you know energy security problem, which is partly about the need to import. Uh, that is, uh, you know, dependency on outside supply, and it's partly about the fact that their 
lines of supply could be interrupted by the United States in a war. Um, not that a U.S.-China war is imminent or anything, but when you're looking to secure uh, your economy, you have to think about whether you, you, somebody could interdict your supplies. And the U.S. totally has that capability at this point to interdict Chinese supplies, whether by pipeline or by sea. But at this point, they really don't have anything they can do about the interdiction threat other than to continue to build up their navy, which is a long-term project, and to try to diversify the sources by building pipelines. So a pipeline that they want to build across Burma, that oil that would go through that pipeline wouldn't have to go through the Straits of Malacca in the South China Sea, or a pipeline that they want to build through Pakistan that wouldn't have to travel that oil through the Indian Ocean. So this is a, a partial measure. But in those places that are their main sources of supply, which are Angola, Sudan, Venezuela, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and their, you know Russia, <coughs> in those <coughs> countries, the Chinese have a um, you know, major interest to defend in what are often very turbulent political situations like the Sudan. You know, I don't think the Chinese are f in favor of genocide particularly or, you know, care much one way or the other about the ruler of the Sudan, but they do have these oil fields that they partially own and pipelines that they depend upon and port facilities that they depend upon in the Sudan. So they're kind of tied up in the Sudan. I don't think Brazil, as far as I know, is a major oil exporter to China, but it certainly is um, a big economic partner of China. And I think for the Chinese, relatively easy to deal with because it's a stable, rational government. But I mean, in the Sudan or in Iran, where they have these oil supplies, the, just the need for oil connects them into complicated diplomatic and political issues. What is China doing to counterbalance the U.S. military presence in Asia, if it's doing something? And the second one uh, is, what are the military allies in, of China in uh, Asia? China has a mutual defense treaty with North Korea. I believe that's their only formal mutual defense treaty. They don't have any military allies, any other military allies at all. They have cooperated in the past. I think they've stopped doing so with the Pakistani nuclear program. That's about it. The US, on the other hand, as you know, has formal and very active and real substantial military defense alliances with Japan, South Korea, with Australia. The American military presence in Asia has got a lot of components. We have 30,000 troops in Japan. We have 35,000 troops in South Korea. We have our big air base on Guam. We, have, uh, we sell arms to Taiwan. We have joint training with India, with Vietnam. We have port call in Singapore. We have military training people in the Philippines and in Indonesia. So it's a vast operation that the U.S. has around China's borders. We rent an airfield in Kyrgyzstan. So what China's doing really is to build up its navy. That's the main way that China's trying to change the military balance. Um, and it is, has created some capabilities that are designed to deal with American forces in a possible conflict. So. Some of the special capabilities that the Chinese have invested in, one is an anti-satellite capability. So when the US conducts warfare, it depends a lot on communications through satellites to coordinate all the different battlefield elements that the US is fielding. So the Chinese have demonstrated the ability to sh once to shoot down a satellite. So the long-term strategy would presumably be in the case of a conflict to shoot down some of the American satellites that are being used for communication. They have a, um, a stealth submarine capability. So one of the major American force projection platforms in Asia is the aircraft carrier 
uh, what's called an aircraft carrier strike group, which consists of an aircraft carrier and many other ships that defend that carrier. But if you can get in with a submarine and hit the aircraft carrier, then that's, you know, that's a big score. So the Chinese have invested in that capability. They have been investing in cyber warfare, as you read in the newspaper a lot. So a lot, a lot of what we read is, you know, they went into the New York Times website and all that kind of a thing. But in the case of an actual warfare scenario, and I don't know, I mean, because this is all very, very secret, so I don't have access to it, but presumably the golden uh, the prize in cyber warfare is to get into the other uh, antagonist's cyber network that he's using in his military. You know, so our military guys are all sort of carrying these little handheld computers in the mountains of Afghanistan. And, uh, and so if you can get into that uh, milita the military um, internet and bring it down, then, then you would really destroy the operations of the antagonist. Well, this is obviously not easy to do, but these are some of the things the Chinese military seems to be investing in. Well, when I introduced you as a China scholar, you can see that it was no understatement. So I thank you really for such a comprehensive oh, and wonderful discussion. Thank you. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.